With the arrival of the cooler weather, already there's snow in some parts of the province, we'll all be spending more time indoors just as COVID-19 numbers take up again. With us for an update and what to expect as winter approaches, from the nation's capital, Rewa Dionandan, epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Health Sciences. Hi. Hello, how are you? I always look forward to our conversations. It's been too long. Um, but right now, when you read the news, it just seems as if a lot of things are happening at the same time. Um, according to the CBC, even with just three days, mis with three days missing from the data, it's been reported that Ontario has 109 new COVID-19 deaths over the past seven days, uh, the single highest death count since early May. Um, how concerned should Ontarians be right now as we move into the winter months? We should always be concerned. Uh, how much concern? Well, that depends on how much faith you have in the variety of mitigation tools we have outlaid and whether or not people will be uptaking those mitigation tools. Here's the thing. Vaccination works really well to prevent the worst outcomes, hospitalization and death, but not perfectly. And the more people who become infected, the more people vaccination is going to fail for. So that's why these uh, death rates are climbing. More people are becoming infected and reinfected. And we're also hearing that we have new variants. Um, can you tell us about the new variants and how concerned we should be about them? There's a soup of new variants, uh, and some of them are more worrying than others. The ones making the news more commonly are BQ1 and BQ1.1, its descendant. And these are descendants of BA5. The thing that makes them scary is their multiple mutations on the spike protein, which makes them more transmissible. And most concerning, they seem to evade the immunity offered by both the original vaccination and by our best antibody treatments. So there is a selection of people in society who rely upon these antibody treatments in lieu of vaccination. And as well, people who rely upon these antibody treatments to treat uh, them when they become sick so that they don't die. And if these antibody treatments are now not going to be effective, well, that's terrifying for a certain number of people in the province. Um, for the rest of us, the vaccine immune escape potential is worrying. It means that we're more likely to become infected. It's not yet known if it causes more serious disease. There's some fringe concern that it may affect the lungs more, which is always a little scary. But the solution here is for everyone to get their bivalent vaccine if they're eligible because that one probably has a bit more efficacy against uh, these new um, subvariants, and also to look into the other mitigation tools that we know work, mask wearing, ventilation, staying away from sick people, et cetera. Well, you mentioned um, how, in your first answer about how the faith that you have in the mitigation tools that we have right now, you also mentioned the vaccines. We know that uh, many people have two, three, even four shots um, against COVID. But as we're learning, those vaccines, the, the efficacy, I guess, wanes over time. You mentioned the bivalent uh, vaccine. Can you tell us what that is and why it's important for people to get that vaccine? Sure. First, the efficacy uh, against the worst outcomes, hospitalization and death, wanes much more slowly. It's mostly the efficacy against preventing infection and symptomatic disease that seems to go by pretty fast. So that's why the boosters are important, and that helps stop or slow transmission in the population. The bivalent vaccines are special because they include not just the original vaccine, which was tailor-made for the original Wuhan strain of the virus, but also it contains elements of Omicron, in particular the BA1 uh, subvariant, for the Moderna vaccine and the BA5 for the Pfizer vaccine. That means that it's probably more closely tailored to what's circulating now and probably offers better neutralizing immunity, meaning that it prevents infection as well as serious disease, at least for a little while. Well, we're learning that uh, the amount of people who have gotten the bivalent vaccine is not as high as it should be or could be. And as we talk about the mitigation uh, measures that were taken before to help curb um, COVID-19, a lot of those are gone. So how do you communicate to people who are, you know, we go out, it feels as if it's 2019, but it's not 2019. So how do you, how do you communicate that message, the importance of people getting yeah. these vaccines and that COVID really is hard. not done? It's really hard because they look around and they don't see the suffering. If you step into an emergency room in a hospital, you'll see the crowdedness. And that's really what this comes down to, is expressing to people the the uh, the close to collapse that our healthcare system is in, 
for a number of reasons, including COVID. And COVID is the trigger that caused all of this. We have the staffing crisis, we have the overcrowded crisis. But the fact that we have more people in hospitals is because more people are getting sick. I don't know how to express this to people except to show them the numbers and to take TV cameras into the hospitals to convince them that this is really happening. We all know people who are getting sick. Part of the problem is a lot of people are getting sick and they're fine because vaccination works. They recover within a few days and they don't go to the hospital. We have to remember we all know people as well who have loved ones who have died. Right? So reminding uh, the world of the mortal toll that this disease has taken and the potential long-term disability toll that it still might take in the form of long COVID, that's what's important. Um, I saw someone tweet, or I'm not sure if it was an article, maybe I think it's something that Andre Picard might have written um, to avoid long COVID, avoid it in the short term. And that's kind of, it feels kind of next to impossible to do that right now. Uh, we're learning more and more about long COVID and the repercussions that it has, not only to our own bodies, but also to the, the system, to the public health. Uh, what do we know about long COVID now that we didn't know, say, maybe a year ago? We know that it seems to be related to the severity of your disease. So the more symptoms you show, the more you suffered when you're infected, the more likely you're going to have long COVID. It seems that the more infections you get, the more likely you're going to get long COVID because each one is a roll of dice. Um, defining long COVID is hard. So it could be symptoms lasting several weeks past the point of recovery depending what recovery is. And oftentimes these studies are based upon self-report. So there's some you know, data uh, bias there. However, it seems like maybe up to 20% of people who become infected report symptoms lasting more than a few weeks past uh, when they should have recovered. And that's by definition long COVID. <sighs> What's causing it? It's unclear. That's a clinical question. I'm not really qualified to answer. It's something that concerns me though. Epidemiologically, I look at the impacts on the population. And even if a tiny percentage of people become um, uh, stricken with long COVID, so many people are becoming infected that we might be looking down the barrel of a long-term disability crisis in the world in the next uh, few years. So until we develop treatments for this, we might be in some serious trouble. Um, you mentioned uh, this could be a worldwide disability crisis. I, I think a lot of us haven't had access to PCR tests. So some of us might test negative on the rats and then we end up kind of going out into the community. Um, how concerned are you about that, at, that so much we're not reporting the numbers as we once did? We don't really have a sense of how much COVID is, is within our uh, communities. Yeah, we're flying blind. So that affects our ability to determine exactly where we are in the trajectory of the pandemic. It affects our ability to ascertain community risk. But at the same time, it doesn't change what we have to do as individuals. We should try to prevent ourselves from becoming infected. Live your lives, absolutely, but take the steps to prevent yourself from becoming infected. If you've already been infected or you suspect you've been infected, just try not to get infected again. Again, for most people, you roll the dice and you'll be fine, but it's the repeated rolling of the dice that's the problem. <clears throat> so it's these reinfections that has a lot of people worried. Like this is dividing the scientific community somewhat. Some people feel that it's fine. Other people feel that this is actually not that great to be reinfected all the time. So I err on the side of um, uh, precaution. Um, in, in the presence of uncertainty, I will err on the side of keeping myself and my family as safe as I can. So I try to avoid infection if I can, while at the same time living my life. Um, you mentioned, uh, I don't want to go too much into the weeds, but you said that it's dividing the scientific community. A lot of us don't really know, you know, we are not experts in this and we're just kind of trying to do yeah. the best that we can. Um, and then you read uh, headlines like in the Global Mail on Wednesday, public health agency preparing for worst case scenario variants as fall resurgence looms. And I'm guessing we might be going into another wave. Uh, what do you think the next wave might look like? I think we're definitely going into another wave, and it's probably peak sometime in December or January, driven by these subvariants, by BQ1, BQ1.1, hopefully not by XBB, which is another variant we haven't talked about that's in uh, Asia right now. And um, it'll look very, very high number of cases. The, the cases have been somewhat disconnected from the death rates because of the awesome power of vaccination, but not completely disconnected. So again, the more people who get infected, that death rate is going to ratchet up. But that shouldn't be what we focus on. We should focus primarily on the hospitalization rate. 
Um, the thing about these new variants, too, is that they seem to increase the risk of reinfection. That is why I think this will be a relatively high wave when it comes to actual infections. But if people take steps, wear their masks, uh, make important choices in their lives, and select that bivalent vaccine, then it might not happen. Right? So we have it in our power to really reduce the impact of this wave. How do you communicate that message? Because honestly, like, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything. If, if there's a division within the scientific community and we're just regular folk, we're just trying to figure out, like, how do you communicate the importance of doing that right now? Yeah, it's really hard, right? Part of it is stepping away from the narrative of individual risk. We're, we're focused on what does this mean for me? What are my chances of getting sick, my chances of dying? Forget about that. Think about your community, your society. If the healthcare system fails, we're all doomed. So it's important that we all take steps, take small steps in our life, even though our individual risk might be perceived to be low, to protect the system and the whole. We have failed in talking about our responsibilities to community. We have to really uh, reinvest in that kind of narrative. You have a child. I have small kids. Uh, I haven't been able to get any Advil or Tylenol, ordered it from Amazon, just got an email. It's not going to come until December. We're seeing what's happening to children's hospitals. There is a strain. Sick children are being transferred uh, from hospitals in their communities to hospitals out of region. Parents are told to bring blankets and toys to emergency rooms because of long uh, visits. Can you help us understand what's happening with children's hospitals? Yeah, I don't fully understand it myself. Keep in mind that we haven't even seen the flu season yet. Flu season is still coming. So get your flu vaccine too. Help reduce the burden on the healthcare system. Kids are experiencing a lot of issues right now, among them RSV, which is a, a respiratory disease that we don't talk enough about. That seems to be running wild right now. That's not COVID, but it's, it looks like it. Um, the common cold is pretty prevalent too, and, and COVID's there as well. But in addition, we have understaffing issues across the board in our hospital system. We have nurses who are burnt out and who can't support their workloads anymore, who are leaving on mass, taking early retirement, et cetera, and who are abused all the time as well. So our hospital system really functions on the backs of nurses and these non-doctor medical professionals. Um, so we really need to invest in supporting them more, encouraging them to stay, encouraging more of them to come into our system. We also need to be triaging better to keep non-serious cases out of the hospital. This is concerning. Uh, if we cannot serve are most vulnerable, by which I mean our children. What kind of society are we? We only have a few minutes left, but I want to sneak in two questions. Uh, we don't really hear the term herd immunity as much anymore. Why is that? Well, for one thing, it was out the window as a, a goal once Omicron came in. Omicron is so contagious that, and the, and the vaccine's efficacy not that high, that the math suggests that you need more than 100% of the population to be immune to achieve herd immunity. Also, this disease ping-pongs between humans and non-human animals. That means so long as a non-human reservoir exists, you can usually become reinfected. Um, this is common in other diseases as well. So it's unlikely COVID would be eradicated. So herd immunity probably won't be with us unless a new vaccine is developed that has extraordinary transmission uh, reducing capability. And that's always in the cards. Um, we've heard from uh, Kieran Moore, the chief medical officer of this province, say that if need be, masking might be reintroduced again as we move into the colder weather. If you could implement only one COVID policy, which one would you say um, gives everyone the best, I guess, money for their health? <laughs> With no political or public pushback, masking, I think. High quality N95 masks subsidized by the government for everybody. They're comfortable. It's not in position. They're safe. Anyone can use them, and they work against all variants. The political pushback against that would be extraordinary, though. And so I think the other option is ventilation improvements in all public spaces. Uh, improve the, the airflow and put better filters in place and CO2 monitors. And that can help enormously as well. And there's less political pushback against that. Rewa, thank you so much. for. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. We always appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.